good morning and a very warm welcome to everyone i yasha nirati presently pursuing masters of science from institute of bioinformatics and applied biotechnology bangalore feel elated to host the third episode of corona virus webinar series it gives me immense pleasure to extend our gratitude and salutation to the guest of honor and the prominent scientists attending this webinar as we have talked in our previous episodes we are trying hard to reach out to the common people and satisfy them by getting their questions with respect to covid-19 answered by our eminent experts there have been a lot of queries regarding the development of different vaccines and approaches towards it therefore we decided to conduct a webinar which is completely dedicated to various aspects of vaccine for covid-19 i feel highly privileged to welcome our honorable guest professor raghavan vardharajan from indian institute of science bangalore he is a biophysicist and is renowned for his researches in the fields of protein structures and its foldings he has contributed in developing the vaccines and drugs for treating a specific type of fatal influenza and hiv1 virus he also holds the patent for the same he along with his team have taken the initiative to work on immunogens derived from the spike glycoprotein of SARS-CoV-2 he has been awarded with Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar prize for science and technology one of the prestigious indian science awards in the year 2002 for his outstanding work in the field of biological science i would now hand over to our guest of honor professor raghavan vardharajan who will be talking to us about covid-19 vaccine development this now please sir okay uh, thank you uh, yasha for the opportunity to talk here now just to say uh, mm -hmm. bandwidth let me uh, see if i can stop the camera and i just continue start with my presentation um so it's now on full screen so uh, yeah. i'll be talking about uh, covid vax covid-19 vaccine development uh, with a little bit of a focus on what's happening in the country now for those of you not familiar with how the uh, immune responses work when the uh, a foreign organism enters the body the first barriers to infection are provided by what's called the innate immune system so amongst these are for example barriers on the skin which prevent uh, infection or organisms from entering once they do enter there are certain kinds of uh, cells of the immune system and molecules of the immune system which uh, recognize them as foreign uh, entities and then target them for destruction and uh, all these constitute the innate immune system if the uh, pathogen is able to escape the immune system and then start to proliferate then what is called adaptive immunity comes into play and so the adaptive immunity consists of is two arms one is called the humoral immunity which is uh, mediated by antibodies and the second is called cellular immunity and what antibodies do is that they bind to uh, the uh, uh, pathogen and prevent it from entering cells and antibodies that are able to, to prevent entry and infection are called neutralizing antibodies there are other kinds of antibodies which once the uh, organism has infected cells once it's coming out the antibodies can uh, recognize even if they are not able to prevent infection they are able to recognize uh, molecules intact 
pathogen molecules on the surface of cells and then uh, there are other mechanisms by which they target these cells for destruction. Uh, the cellular immunity, as the name suggests, it is involved in uh, targeting uh, in, in a variety of functions, but an important uh, function is to target infected cells. So once the pathogen infects the cell, uh, it gets uh, some of the molecules from the pathogen get chopped up and they go to the cell surface. And these fragments are recognized as foreign uh, by the uh, T cells. And then that recognition event targets the infected cells uh, for destruction. So these are the ways in which the uh, infection is uh, targeted and uh, dealt with. So the, the adaptive immunity, which is the part after the innate, innate immunity, it displays a number of characteristics. So you, there has to be specificity for the antigen. It should be capable of recognizing many different kinds of antigens. And it should be able to discriminate uh, between the foreign and self molecules. And finally, there should be memory. That is, uh, once an infection has occurred, the immune system should remember uh, so that the next time the uh, pathogen uh, enters the body, the response is much quicker. So uh, vaccines seek to uh, elicit the protective immune responses in the absence of an infection so that uh, you already have immune memory, and when the body sees the pathogen, it's able to rapidly react. Okay. So there are many different kinds of vaccines that are available, and I'll be focusing largely on, of course, the COVID-19, which is a virus. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about viral vaccines. So the uh, uh, very widely and commonly used uh, vaccines are the inactivated vaccines. And what these consist of is the uh, infectious organism is blown up in large quantities and then it's inactivated. So it's made non-infectious. And this can be either by treatment with a chemical uh, or by uh, some other means. And once you have this, uh, uh, this inactivated organism or uh, prote proteins from the organism, which are no longer uh, by themselves able to cause an infection, uh, that preparation is what is called the inactivated vaccine. And so common inactivated vaccines uh, that are widely used are for polio and for influenza and for many other uh, diseases. So this is one of the modalities being explored in the case of COVID-19. There are also what are called toxoid vaccines in which the toxic molecule the, uh, from the infectious organism is taken and inactivated or made non-toxic and then uh, injected into the body. And the uh, antibodies raised against this are able to uh, often protect against infection of the whole organism. For certain kinds of bacteria display carbohydrates, sugar molecules on their cell surface. And so those sugar molecules are also recognized as foreign by our immune systems. And uh, in order to make them produce uh, more antibodies, they are conjugated to what's called a carrier protein. So those are conjugate vaccines. Then we have DNA vaccines in which DNA, uh, which uh, we take one or more genes from the infectious organism and uh, clone it into a, a plasmid. And then this uh, is then injected into the body. So the idea is that if this uh, DNA is able to enter our cells, then the cells will uh, read the DNA. And uh, from the DNA, they will make RNA. And the RNA in turn will be read by the cellular machinery to make proteins. And these will be the proteins from the foreign organism. Uh, there are also a, a very new modality, which has uh, gained prominence, especially with COVID-19, are what are called mRNA vaccines. Now, DNA vaccines, uh, because there is a very, very small uh, possibility that they might be integrated into the cellular DNA, and that's, of course, an undesirable feature. So the mRNA vaccines don't have this particular issue, and they are 
seemingly a little better at eliciting antibodies uh, than the DNA vaccines. So the, both the DNA and the mRNA vaccines, DNA vaccines, the idea has been around for a long time, but there aren't any licensed vaccines with this modality. mRNA vaccines have gained prominence only in the past year or so, and they have really, uh, uh, you know, uh, come into prominence with the current COVID-19 pandemic. Then we have subunit vaccines, and subunit vaccines consist of uh, a protein or proteins from the infectious organism, typically the surface protein, uh, which is what the immune system first sees. And these are cloned and expressed and produced uh, in uh, uh, vaccine manufacturers, uh, man vaccine manufacturing companies. And then they are uh, used to immunize along site typically with another molecule which stimulates the immune system called an adjuvant, a molecule or a preparation. And finally, we have live attenuated vaccines, which are weakened forms of the infectious organism. And uh, they are also widely used for many diseases. Now, in the specific case of COVID-19, uh, all of these, uh, except of course for the toxoid and conjugate, uh, all of these are being attempted. And the ones that have uh, initially uh, um, come into prominence uh, or have been uh, in clinical trials, the quickest are the nucleic acid-based vaccines, especially the mRNA vaccines. And while these are potentially very promising, they have never been really manufactured or tested on a large scale before. So uh, we don't know how well they will actually work. And there is no manufacturing expertise for these kind of vaccines currently uh, in India. And furthermore, we don't know uh, in the real world where you know continuous refrigeration is not always possible, how it will impact the efficacy of these vaccines. So while they are very promising modality, they remain to be uh, tested in the real world situation. So all, of all of these, uh, my own personal bias is uh, for subunit vaccines because they are very, very well tested uh, modality. Uh, and there are many vaccine manufacturers in India who can make these kind of vaccines. So now a word about how long it takes to uh, develop vaccines. The first step is of course the laboratory research, which is can, can take you know, many, many years to identify the proper antigens or the proper molecules to include from the pathogen in the vaccine. Then once these are identified, uh, we test these uh, vaccine formulations, typically in small animals, to find out if they induce an effective response uh, in terms of antibodies and also in, in, in T cells, in terms of T cells. Uh, but for most, especially viral vaccines, the uh, ability to elicit antibodies which can block infection, that is really the major goal. Uh, so the uh, uh, next step, once we have good data in animals and find that it's apparently safe in animals, is to test these uh, uh, vaccines in humans. And so there are different stages of the testing. The first is what is called a phase one trial, in which we immunize a small number of people and sequentially, not all at the same time. And the major objective of the phase one trial is to ensure that the vaccine is safe and uh, because you have to remember that vaccines are given to healthy people and they're given to very very large numbers of people so safety is an overriding concern uh, for vaccines the next step is a phase two trial in which we take a larger group of subjects and look uh, in them also for safety and what's called immunogenicity uh, which is to look at how uh, good of an immune response the vaccine is uh, provoking. And one can also look at doses, immunization schedules, and so on. And this, some of this can be done in a phase one also. The next step is a phase three trial in which we take thousands or tens of thousands of people. And here, one really looks at the efficacy, of course, safety in larger numbers, but the efficacy, which means that we look to see in the real world, compared to a placebo, which is, you know, which, uh, which is 
people who are immunized with something that doesn't contain the, the, the real vaccine formulation, uh, how much better does the vaccine protect against the infection than the placebo? And once this is done, uh, of course, the vaccine can be licensed for, uh, uh, for selling to people. Now, you can see that these typical timelines take many, many years. In the case of the present pandemic, uh, everyone is really uh, seized with the urgency of getting a vaccine out as soon as possible. And so, although the, the infectious organism was only really identified uh, at the beginning of this year or the end of last year, we already have multiple study uh, cases where we have ongoing phase one and phase two and uh, shortly phase uh, three trials. So the world is moving very rapidly forward to try and get a vaccine for uh, COVID-19. Okay. So again, I, uh, just to break up a little bit the initial stages of the uh, vaccine development, so first is the antigen discovery. The next is the uh, we look at the safety and uh, efficacy. And then we also have to, uh, when transitioning from a lab to a manufacturing situation, you have to uh, work out a, a, a manufacturing process. And this also can take several months. And then the final manufactured uh, vaccine has to be uh, also tested for uh, its uh, stability. Uh, and then later on for its uh, safety and uh, toxicity. And then one needs to uh, carry out uh, a manufacturing run on a small scale, uh, which would exactly mimic the way in which the final vaccine formulation is going to be made. And it is this uh, product or this formulation which then is tested in humans. So as you can see, the whole thing can take uh, uh, quite a long time. Um, and right now we need to accelerate this process and some of the acceleration can only happen if the uh, regulatory pathways, uh, the steps that the regulators take uh, are uh, somewhat shortened because this conventional uh, development timeline will be much too long for, for the current pandemic situation. So there are efforts underway to accelerate this process. And certainly outside India, it, this has been done. And in India also, it is happening, but probably not at the same rate as, as outside the country. Okay. So now, just to remind you that uh, respiratory viruses are nothing new. And the fact that there would be a pandemic is, again, nothing surprising. So for example, in 1918, there was an influenza pandemic, which killed close to 100 million people in a few months. And in comparison, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has killed roughly about half a million people since, uh, since January uh, this year. So uh, while, of course, this is a very deadly and dangerous disease, there have been other far worse uh, uh, pandemics uh, in, in often, uh, you know, which occurred due to a peculiar combination of circumstances. Uh, 1918 was just the end of the First World War and there were a lot of people in close proximity. Uh, we did not have all the tools we have today uh, to, to, uh, to stem uh, these infections. But nevertheless, respiratory viruses are a very major global health threat. And uh, so the fact that COVID-19 has come is again not a surprise. When it would come and where it would come and how bad it would be, those are all, of course, things that no one needs new. But even when this passes, you know, there will be a threat of future uh, respiratory virus pandemics also. And these are particularly hard to stop because they involve transmission from one person to another. Okay. Uh, so the just a word about the coronavirus. Uh, it's uh, the viral genetic material, which is RNA, is surrounded by a membrane. And on the surface of the membrane is a protein called the spike glycoprotein. So what the immune system sees is essentially this spike glycoprotein. And so antibodies that can bind to the spike glycoprotein and prevent it from binding to its receptor. And as some of you may know, the receptor is a molecule called ACE2. Uh, so the uh, antibodies which can prevent this binding 
obviously will prevent infection and this is one class of what are called neutralizing antibodies and probably the major class of, of neutralizing antibodies so uh, once the uh, virus so shown at the bottom panel is, is what happens this is just the molecular structural representation of the spike protein uh, at the bottom once it binds to the uh, to the receptor this uh, um, green blue circle the uh, then this molecule undergoes a series of conformational changes changes in its shape which allow the virus to enter the cell okay so this is just the three dimensional structure or a representation of the three dimensional structure of the spike glycoprotein so it's a large protein over a thousand amino acid residues in length and already people have discovered many antibodies uh, that can prevent infection so many neutralizing antibodies and we know now in this very short period of time where these antibodies bind on the surface of the protein and the majority of the neutralizing antibodies bind to a, a domain which is called the receptor binding domain and the receptor binding domain is what binds to the ACE2 receptor. So the majority of the neutralizing antibodies found either bind to this receptor binding domain which is shown in red on the top panel and some bind to the uh, another uh, domain called the N-terminal domain. Very recently people have found these kinds of antibodies and there are undoubtedly some neutralizing antibodies which bind to other regions but they are a smaller in, in number. Okay, so now this is the number of uh, vaccine candidates that are in various uh, stages of testing and this number changes every day. Okay, so this is this data is as of uh, a few a couple of weeks ago. So they are close to 150 uh, vaccine candidates and most of them are what are called uh, preclinical uh, so that is they have not yet entered human testing uh, some have entered human testing and uh, because uh, they have already the animal tests were satisfactory and so they are in phase one phase two and phase three trials and there is one uh, vaccine which has very limited human uh, use approval for members of the chinese army so the uh, uh, vaccine modalities that are uh, that are being tested right now in the clinic are uh, inactivated vaccines um, uh, and uh, uh, separate from the inactivated vaccines are what are called viral vector vaccines where we have uh, the antigens from the uh, SARS coronavirus being incorporated into another virus uh, which is not uh, which is of course less harmful and typically this is an adenovirus and so you may have heard of the Oxford vaccine trials. They involve a chimpanzee adenovirus in which the spike protein gene has been cloned. And that has been uh, tested, uh, in, in, it's being tested in the clinic right now. Then we have subunit vaccines, as I said, uh, uh, which are also, in, for, in my view, for India are particularly suitable. And these are uh, also being uh, tested. And then we have DNA and RNA vaccines. Okay. Now, if one looks at the, uh, the distribution of the different kinds of vaccines, uh, again, this is data as of uh, uh, 29th June, you can see that a variety of them are in different uh, uh, stages of testing. The nucleic acid vaccines, because they can be made relatively quickly, so th there are a larger number of those in clinical uh, testing right now. But if you look at the overall distribution, including preclinical uh, those uh, in preclinical studies, the largest number is for the uh, subunit vaccines. If one looks at the distribution of uh, uh, vaccine developers, okay, uh, then uh, of course, the largest number of them are in America and Europe. Asia has a reasonable number. A lot of them are in China, uh, along with uh, a few in India. So the Chinese ones are uh, shown separately. Uh, and very few in, in Africa, uh, though there are some. So now if we look at 
some vaccines that have entered the clinic. The, now, the next few slides may be a little uh, technical, so I uh, apologize for that. Uh, but uh, this is a clinical trial of a recombinant adenoviral vaccine by a Chinese company called CanSino Biologics. So what I would like you to look at is uh, where it says neutralizing antibodies. Okay, So these numbers are the serum dilution uh, at which uh, the uh, neutralizing antibodies were, uh, so it, basically if you have a higher number of, of, of these uh, titers of neutralizing antibodies, that means the vaccine is better. So to give you an idea uh, of people who have recovered from infection, typically have neutralizing antibody titer values of above 100 or so. And here you can see these numbers, 8.2, 9.6, and so on and so forth. They have been uh, uh, very low. Okay. So uh, the inactivated vaccine has, although it was able to protect uh, in animal models, uh, both in animals and in people, it has uh, elicited very low uh, titers of neutralizing antibodies. Now, this may not mean that it's ineffective. It just means that it has not elicited large numbers of neutralizing antibodies. There are other modes of protection as well. And this was true uh, so far of all the viral vectored vaccines that have been looked at, including the chimpanzee adenoviral vaccine uh, from Oxford, uh, which was also tested in monkeys. This is data from an RNA vaccine. And here, uh, uh, this was by a, a company called, a German company called BioNTech in uh, collaboration with Pfizer. And here, if you look at the neutralizing antibody titers, you can see that they are quite a bit higher than in the previous slide. And so these are uh, comparable or a little bit higher than what is seen in people who have recovered uh, from infection. So don't worry about the left-hand panel. Just look at the right-hand panel. This is a log scale. And these numbers, 168 to 67, these are the neutralizing antibody titers uh, uh, at different doses of the vaccine. So this is with the 10 microgram dose, and this is with a 30 microgram dose. And so these have elicited uh, reasonable titers of neutralizing antibodies. This is another study uh, from Moderna, which is a US company uh, also making mRNA vaccines, which has received a, a lot of scrutiny and publicity. And here uh, also you can see that, uh, again, just ignore the left-hand panel, just look at the right-hand panel. So uh, these are different doses of the, the uh, vaccine formulation that were given. And you can see that uh, in the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, that at, at a later time point, okay, after uh, multiple doses, um, two doses, I believe, there were reasonable titers of uh, neutralizing antibodies. So this number is about 500, uh, is what you can see. So this was immunization with an mRNA vaccine expressing the spike uh, protein, and it was, in uh, it was encased in lipid nanoparticles. And at higher uh, doses, there were some uh, adverse effects. A phase two study has been initiated and the results will be uh, available in due course of time. So to summarize very broadly the existing clinical data that's available, there's phase one data available in the public domain for an inactivated virus vaccine, uh, adenoviral vectors, as well as uh, mRNA vaccines. And very soon there will be, I'm sure, additional uh, clinical data for subunit vaccines. So, so far the neutralizing antibody uh, levels that have been produced by the vaccines in humans have been similar to those in small animals. So that this is very encouraging because means, it means that the small animal studies are predictive of what's going to happen uh, in, in humans. And these uh, neutralizing antibodies have been low for both inactivated virus and adenoviral vectors, but better for the mRNA vaccines. Uh, and it's also seen that uh, there is some evidence to suggest that relatively low titers of neutralizing antibodies appear sufficient to protect non-human primates, so that is uh, monkeys, uh, from uh, uh, 
uh, from uh, disease, from serious lung disease when they were challenged with the virus. But you know the monkey uh, do not really replicate very well uh, all the symptoms that are there uh, in humans. And most important, we still don't understand when we immunize. We can measure various parameters uh, uh, associated with the immunization. And neutralizing antibodies are an easy parameter to measure, and they are known to correlate with protection. But in, in other cases, but in this particular uh, infection, because we are still learning a lot, we don't know all the measures that we can that will correlate with protection, and neither do we know the duration of protection after either infection or vaccination. There are a number of vaccines which are uh, under development in uh, India, and uh, these are listed uh, over here. There isn't time to go through all of them, but they essentially encompass the various modalities which, uh, which I described earlier. And uh, including, uh, there is some effort uh, from my lab in collaboration with the startup Minvax uh, to uh, work on subunit vaccines for uh, uh, for COVID-19. So uh, many of these efforts are by uh, large Indian manufacture, vaccine manufacturers. And India has, in fact, some of the largest vaccine manufacturers in the world, something uh, we can be quite proud about. And uh, many of these are in collaboration with, uh, um, uh, with uh, companies or uh, academic institutions outside of India. The majority of them, in fact, uh, are fall into that category. And then there are a few uh, indigenous efforts uh, also uh, for this. So one of them is the inactivated virus vaccine, which is a collaboration between Bharat Biotech and ICMR. Uh, and then there are uh, also uh, a live attenuated vaccine, uh, which a small uh, company from uh, Pune, uh, another uh, and, and, and MinVax, and, and I'm sure there are others which, which we are not uh, aware about, which are uh, being tested. Okay, so now just to look at the timeline for which the uh, current vaccines have been developed, as I said, vaccine development typically can take many, many years. This is the timeline for the Moderna mRNA uh, vaccines progress into clinical trials. So the uh, uh, first report of the respiratory virus outbreak in Wuhan was in December 31st. By January 10th, the sequence of the virus was available. And a few days later, based on a lot of earlier experience with the MERS coronavirus and other coronaviruses, uh, the Vaccine Research Center, the NIH in the USA, and Moderna, which is the company I was talking about, they decided on what sequence of mRNA should be put in the vaccine. And then uh, they immediately the next day were able to initiate uh, uh, GMP production of, of the vaccine. And uh, in uh, so this was January 14th, uh, within a little over a month, they had evidence for the uh, immunogenicity or, or the kinds of antibodies uh, or the efficacy of the vaccine in mice. And around the same time, the three-dimensional structure of the spike glycoprotein was published. And uh, uh, just about a week later, the actual vaccine formulation was available to initiate a clinical trial. So you can see this astonishing timeline of three months from the start of a clinical trial to the report of the respiratory virus outbreak. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, along with Moderna, I have also presented data for several other manufacturers who have also been able to uh, uh, achieve a very, very rapid progress into getting into the clinic. Now, of course, we will not know the efficacy of these really until there is a, a phase three data available. Okay. So just in contrast, you know, this is of course a much, much smaller effort uh, on our part. So at the end of uh, January, we were engaged by the Gates Foundation to initiate vaccine design. We made several designs and within about uh, a month, we were able to immunize the animals. The reason it took this long is that, you know, all the genes that we had to make, they had to be supplied by external suppliers located outside the country. And so this whole process, uh, you know, took the major chunk of time. And then uh, a few weeks uh, later, we had uh, 
uh, our initial data from the first bleeds from animals. And by the end of April, so that's about a month later, we had um, uh, data from uh, additional data from the animals. And then a few days later, we were able to get virus neutralization assays done at uh, THSTI in Faridabad. And we, you can see that we have pretty good neutralization titers, quite comparable to what the very, very large uh, companies have, have achieved. And then, of course, depending on how uh, the regulatory processes go and additional testing goes, and of course, funding, we could in principle be ready to initiate phase one trials in, in, in a few months, but not in India under the current regulatory framework. Okay. So this is the kind of uh, uh, things that we have to do uh, and uh, to before we can initiate a clinical trial. Okay. So now, uh, you know, how can our response to future uh, pandemic threats, uh, not just pandemic threats, but any other threats be improved. I think it's worth, you know, thinking about this as we uh, move forward. So fundamentally, you know, as a country, we need timely, adequate and broad-based funding. So there's a sufficient pool of expertise because we don't know where the next threat is going to come from. It could be a virus, you know, it could be uh, an earthquake, it, it could be anything, but all of these have to be, uh, there has to be a sufficient pool of expertise to deal with the situation. And uh, unfortunately, in India, the scientific community is spread very thin and the funding is also not uh, entirely regular. And these things make it very, very difficult to, uh, to address uh, broad uh, societal problems in, in a timely uh, manner. Now, particularly in the case of the pandemic, as we have been working through it, there are several things that became readily apparent, okay? And that we need within our borders, within our national borders. So we need much, much better surveillance to know when a, 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 a new pathogen is, is coming up. This pathogen came from the outside, but even within the country, you know, there's a constant threat of uh, uh, possible uh, uh, infections happening. You, you would all have seen what happened during the Nipah uh, scare uh, a, little, uh, a little while ago. So we need much better surveillance. Now, in the particular case of uh, our experience has been that the step that has taken and slowed us the most is getting genes synthesized because this cannot be done very well within the country. And um, with the pandemic and with the lockdown, it was extremely difficult to uh, get molecules uh, made. In order to do uh, animal testing, we need many more facilities which can do this, which have high levels of uh, biosafety. And we need to be able to do studies uh, in non-human primates. It's currently very, very difficult. And at present, as far as I'm aware, it's not possible to do a non-human primate challenge study where we actually vaccinate and then challenge the monkeys with the virus uh, within the country. We do not have those facilities. We need very rapid approvals for, uh, for animal work, faster regulatory work pathways. And we really do need exceptions for carrying out work and sending and receiving materials in a lockdown. It was really a very, very difficult job uh, for us when, when the lockdown happened, despite all the very strong institutional support uh, we have received. So with this, I will uh, just stop and uh, take uh, questions. Um, of course, I would like to thank the, I haven't listed the individual names of people who have contributed, but uh, several members of my own research group who were allowed to stay back and work during the lockdown have worked very, very hard to make some of these things happen. Minvax is the startup which I co-founded and which we work with very closely. And without them, uh, you know, all of these animal studies, um, many of the studies would have been completely infeasible and impossible along the timelines that uh, we have uh, been able to carry them out. All the neutralization assays, the data that I showed were done at uh, the Translational Health Science and Technology Institute at Faridabad. And they are the people who have established these assays uh, very rapidly uh, within the country and working with uh, fully infectious virus. Um, and also some of our the initial bleeds were sent to uh, Professor Stalin's lab at Iser Trivandrum, who is an expert at working with coronaviruses. Unfortunately, his lab was shut 
down later because of the lockdown, so we could not send some of our later samples to him. And uh, this work would not have happened without crucial initial funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who really uh, initiated uh, this work and got me started working on this very challenging and, and difficult problem. So with that, I would like to stop here and I'm happy to uh, take questions. Thank you so much, sir, for such an informative talk. Your deliberation has enlightened us with various aspects of today's topic. I now request the audience to show up in the comment section in case of any queries related to today's topic. Uh, we'll surely entertain your questions after a short discussion with sir. Okay, shall I stop sharing my screen? Uh, uh, oh. Yes, sir, it has already been stopped. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so, sir, recently I've seen that uh, people in the in South Korea, approximately 350 such cases are there where people are getting reinfected. Means they got infection, recovered, and again they're testing positive. And 15% of the population in China are also suffering from the same situation. So what do you think? Is it uh, because they have weak immunity or is, or is it because of the uh, failure of the testing kit that it, that it is giving a false negative result? So as, you have yeah, I, you know, this is, I'm, I'm not sure that I can give a definitive answer, but as far as yeah. I know, there haven't yeah. been strong evidence for, uh, you know, for, for reinfection. Uh, hmm. um, in people who have actually been infected with the virus and have had uh, uh, symptoms. So I'm not you know, aware of a lot of those studies, but intrinsically I would imagine that people who are uh, infected uh, will have for some time a protection to, to reinfection. And I think that's the general uh, consensus in, in, in the field. Uh, and even people with asymptomatic infections uh, also do have, uh, it's been seen that they have protective antibodies, albeit at lower titers than uh, those who have uh, had you know, uh, documented clinical uh, infections. Um, so I believe infection will, will certainly protect for how long and how well, of course, that only the future studies will, will show. So when we look into the immunity of an, of an individual, so uh, it follows a proper blueprint that for severe symptom, it gives severe or strong immune responses. Whereas in uh, when we look into the coronavirus infection, it leads to mild symptoms or as you just said that it doesn't show any symptoms at all. And therefore it leads to low yield of immune cells or antibodies. So, can this be a, a approach or can this be a thought process that the people are getting reinfected? But I, I think that has to be properly you know, documented. As I say, I'm not aware okay. of you know, strong evidence which, which shows uh, reinfection. Of course, reinfection will happen at some, some point, but that, that mm -hmm. it could happen within a few months of uh, infection, you know, and we are only really a few months into the pandemic. That would be, you know, uh, to me, quite surprising uh, if that were to be a normal event. In, in exceptional cases, maybe if somebody was severely immunocompromised, uh, mm -hmm. but, but for the normal population, I would strongly doubt that that would be a, a common situation. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir, um, also uh, yeah. in the studies, I've seen that a high number of neutrophils, one of the as you've discussed in your talk, uh, talk that a high num amount of neutrophils in the body leads to uh, lower production of antibodies. For example, they, they said that the, there is an inverse correlation between the number of neutrophils and the antibodies. So I had this uh, idea in my mind, sir, that if we could uh, give some inhibitor to the production of neutrophils, can we increase the amount of antibodies into the blood, which would definitely give a stronger immune response and fight against the virus? Yeah, I'm not. So I, I think you know, by the time um, people are diagnosed with 
the infection, a lot of the immune responses have been initiated. So I'm not sure how easy it would be. And, and once they are diagnosed with infection, I think clinicians' uh, primary uh, goal would be to treat the infection. And um, so there are many other... So in, in the case of how well the, uh, the person is able to counter the infection, you know, antibodies are one source of the way they, they counter things. But there are many other ways in which the body is, is reacting to counter the infection. And how serious an infection is depends on, you know, many factors in the individual, including their underlying comorbidities and things like that. So... I'm not sure that this would be, you know, the the uh, the best okay. way to, to directly uh, treat the individual once they are infected. And again, the clinician's main concern is to treat the present infection. They're not really mm -hmm. worried about, you know, uh, how many how many antibodies will come and how well they'll be protected against future infections. Okay, okay, sir. Sir, so when we come to the vaccination. So we expect the vaccine should produce a stronger immune response. So, sir, so, uh, recently I've read also that there is a double damage uh, Oxford vaccine, uh, which they are uh, doing in a uh, in a couple of primer and the booster. So, when they give the booster dose, it elevates the immune response, and it has been positively reported in. In case of pigs, but again, when it was tested in mice, it failed. So, sir, uh, do you think that we can have a complete confidence on the vaccine that is being developed that it will give a proper and a very strong immune response? So, the Oxford, at least the, the monkey data that's available and the animal data. It suggested mm -hmm. that the neutralizing antibodies produced by both the Oxford as well as the adenoviral vaccine, those levels were relatively low. Now, uh, one of the advantages of the viral vaccines is that they better mimic an infection than a subunit vaccine. So, uh, because the uh, the proteins are being produced inside the infected cells, which is what happens in an actual infection. So uh, they, these sort of vaccines will typically produce uh, better uh, cellular immunity uh, than what you have from a subunit vaccine. So I think it's much too, it's just, although the neutralizing antibodies are not great, one would have to await the results of a phase three study with the different mm -hmm. vaccine modalities to see in the real world, you know, how, how well they do. I think at this point, it's really too early to say what, what is going to happen. So the Oxford vaccine in monkeys was able to um, prevent severe lung disease, but it didn't really cut down the viral titers in, in the nasal secretions, which uh, is something that would be uh, desirable. Neither were the neutralizing antibody titers very high. Uh, but again, we don't know all the mechanisms which are responsible for protection in, you know, in a real infection. And it's only in a phase three trial that we will get that information, I believe. So. Okay, sir. Okay. So, uh, sir, in your talk, you, you discussed about different uh, types of vaccines, that is live attenuated, inactivated vaccine, topsoid. So I would like to know, sir, on what factors do we decide that for this particular disease we'll have to design this type of vaccine for example for uh, smallpox and for rotavirus we have this live attenuated vaccine for hepatitis a we have inactivated vaccine so what factors help us to decide that for this disease we should try and uh, go for this particular type of vaccine yeah, for example yeah, many factors. You see, with the live attenuated vaccine, uh, again, it has the advantages that it's mimicking a real infection. The problem is that there's a fine balance between how weakened the virus is and uh, how strong the immune response is. 
So the weaker the virus, the weaker will be the immune response against it. Now, if you have too strong an immune, if you have, if the virus is not weakened enough, then it's possible that although you will get a stronger immune response in people who are not able to mount that immune response, right? There could be significant uh, possibility of harm uh, caused by the live attenuated virus. So getting that balance right is is difficult to do, and. Uh, in due course of time, certainly one could come up with a live attenuated uh, virus vaccine. Uh, but at this moment where, uh, you know, the uh, priority is to get something working as soon as possible, that yeah. might be a little bit a little bit more challenging to do. There are efforts on to do this, uh, but certainly if you look at the distribution of uh, uh, modalities which are being tried, the live attenuated is not majorly populated in the bar graph that I showed. So, okay. you know, so what is the appropriate uh, vaccine? And it depends on many, many things. It also depends upon the vaccine cost, right? Upon whether, uh, how well one is able to maintain a cold chain um, and many, many things. So I think it's not possible to give a simple answer to this question. As I said, my bias, uh, for uh, Indian conditions, uh, if one can find an efficacious subunit vaccine that can be rapidly produced and cheaply produced, then that would be uh, my uh, favored choice. But you know, everybody has their own biases, including me. Okay, okay, sir. So, sir, to in order to uh, get get best vaccine candidate, we can uh, uh, we can introduce some computational tools and methods and that is something we called as reverse vaccinology where we use the computational tools and methods which would help us to understand which one which vaccine would be the best candidate and work in such situation so sir in what in to what extent you think that this reverse vaccinology can help us i mean it's certainly uh... The, the thing is, again, there's not a straightforward answer because it depends on, you know, the first question is what is the best vaccine modality? As I said, the subunit vaccines, right, they, they are certainly good for producing antibodies. They're less good for uh, eliciting what are called, uh, uh, you know, uh, CD8 T cell responses. And so then it becomes a question to which we don't know the answer of, you know, what are the most important features of the immune response that you would like to be induced by a vaccine? In other words, what are the correlates, the immune correlates of protection? And we don't know that for this particular disease because we are still very, very early in understanding it. Uh, so, you know, of course, computational uh, insights are useful. And even in <coughs> designing the the protein antigens, even for the subunit vaccine for which I'm most familiar, one can use uh, uh, computational methods to try and figure out, you know, which part of the protein you need to use, uh, how you can stabilize the protein through mutations so that uh, it, it, it elicits a better immune response. And similarly, one can use all of these approaches, uh, you know, you can use these kinds of approaches to, uh, to get uh, better uh, T-cell uh, the immunity also. Uh, but having said all that, <clears throat> because, you know, the uh, uh, there's a lot that we don't understand. And so there's a lot of empirical testing that has to be done. And, um, you know, we are not, because we don't know the importance of the various factors that are required to uh, generate a, a long-lived, effective, protective response to this virus, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a limited amount that we can do computationally. Okay. A lot of it has to be done through empirical testing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we are talking about different approaches, so uh, there was something that came into my mind and also you have discussed in your talk, that we can have an approach towards peptide vaccine where we can as we you showed in your presentation that we have this spike protein we have mapped the spike protein so can we use that data and develop a peptide vaccine which could be effective 
to give a strong immune response so the, so peptides i mean again for people who are not familiar peptides are small fragments of of proteins basically and so the 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 neutralizing antibodies what they recognize is the shape of the intact spike protein okay and that entire three dimensional shape is not very easy to capture by a smaller peptide so while you can have fragments of the spike protein as vaccines those often tend to be somewhat large fragments they are not really peptides so okay um, i don't see you know peptides as being able to produce the right kinds of neutralizing antibodies that that we require uh, so uh, so there are certainly roles for peptides in uh, uh, producing facilitating cellular immunity but but less so for for antibodies okay sir so uh, also uh, you talked about uh, adenovirus type 5 uh, virus which where we can use it as a genetically engineered vector where uh, which has a replication defect and can express sars cov2 spike protein so sir i would like to, i would request you to kindly throw some light that how this genetically engineered vector we are creating because we have people who do not ha- know what genetically engineered vectors are so i would right. like you a little bit uh, explain it so we know that you know the genome sequence of of the the adenovirus and so um, it so what you can what people have shown earlier is that you can into this into the genome of the adenovirus you can insert a foreign sequence uh, so that uh, which will not greatly uh, uh, which will still uh, not prevent the virus from being grown in cell culture and now so when you take this uh, 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 you know modified virus which uh, also has the gene or genes for the foreign proteins then and you produce it in the laboratory or in cell culture and now you take this virus and you allow it to infect uh, people okay uh, by uh, yeah. administering it through the appropriate route then the virus is going to infect cells because it is replication defective it's not going to be able to replicate and come out of the of the cells and, and you know cause uh, a severe infection nevertheless because the adenovirus is able to enter the cells then the genetic material will now be read by the cells machinery and it's going to the cell is now going to produce both the adenoviral proteins as well as the Uh, uh the the foreign protein whose sequence you have inserted into the adenovirus and so when that foreign protein is produced and it it goes outside the cells it's recognized by the immune system and and yes. so that and and antibodies are generated so so instead of directly putting making the protein and injecting it into a person you uh, make the virus the modified virus the virus goes uh, into the person and then the human body produces the viral proteins um, so yeah. uh, and it mounts an immune response not only against the the sars cov2 protein but against all the adenoviral proteins also so the problem is that if there's pre existing immunity to the adenovirus then those antibodies will initially itself bind to the adenovirus and prevent infection um, and similarly once you have immunized there's only a limited number of times you can reimmunize with the same vector because the body is producing then antibodies to the adenoviral proteins and it will damp down the efficacy for future uh, uh, you know reimmunizations okay so sir uh, while talking about the approaches uh, i felt like uh, i f- one more idea came into my mind that the basic concept for the vaccine is to generate memory cells uh, in the primary response so that these memory cells can store the memory of the uh, virus that has been injected in the body and when later the secondary infection occurs and with great intensity then our immune response is also at its peak so can we just inject memory cells from infected people 
to healthy people as a vaccine. Uh, so I think there is a network issue. We'll try to solve it as soon as possible. So uh, I think there is some network problem at uh, the guest speaker's end. Uh, till then, we can uh, have a small discussion or what uh, Sir has been talking till now. So basically, uh, my approach towards this question that I just asked was, if we could inject the memory B cell from an infected person to a healthy individual is because as Sir told in his presentation, that there are certain level of immune response when we uh, inject. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, um, uh, sorry. I, uh, I was uh, I was logged out because uh, the power went off over here. So, uh, it's okay, sir. It's okay, sir. Yeah. So I would like to uh, repeat the question once again. Yeah. So, sir, um, I had this thing in my mind that uh, there can be an approach where we could inject memory B cell from infected individual to a healthy individual as a vaccine. Uh, so the, the thing is the, the number of memory cells are A, not necessarily that large. And the memory cells are not, uh, the number which are circulating in the blood are not large. So okay. getting, you know, you would have to target uh, the, so these germinal centers and so on where, and where the memories and other regions where the memory cells are abundant are not regions where you can easily and non-invasively access them. Okay. okay. So, so that, uh, and also different people are, are different, right? They have, uh, hmm. Which is why you have transplant rejection and so on and so forth. So I don't think that's a practicable uh, approach to, to take okay. memory cells from one individual and put them into another. Okay, sir. Okay. So, sir, uh, when we look at these approaches, do you think that they'll differ with the age of an individual? For example, a small child of uh, maybe one year old or two year old or uh, senior citizens. Does the approach change with the age of an individual? Because we have seen that uh, people who are uh, 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 senior citizens, they are affected more and they are in more fatal condition. So do you think that the approach of the vaccine will differ with the age of an individual? Uh, yes, so it is. Uh, so we know, of course, uh, as you correctly point out that uh, the senior citizens and young children for many viral diseases, those are the people most at risk. Now, in the case of COVID-19, it turns out that the younger, uh, young children are, do not appear to be for the large part uh, very seriously affected. And so the primary uh, um, people who are at risk are elderly people and those with comorbidities. Okay? And especially in elderly people, the immune responses uh, decrease with age. And so the response to vaccination, this is best studied in the case of flu vaccines. Uh, it is less for elderly people. And so there are, in the case of influenza vaccines, there's a high dose vaccine, which just yeah. contains more of the antigen. And that is what is recommended for, for elderly people. Uh, and for similar reasons, live attenuated vaccines are often not given to, to young children uh, in case they're okay. not able to. So, so it's possible that there may be some you know, modalities which are more suited to uh, elderly uh, people. Or maybe the dosage has to be you know, increased or other things have to be done. It's possible, but it's at the moment we don't have enough data to, to know uh, for COVID-19. Okay, sir. So now, just now you told that live attenuated vaccine is not uh, given to uh, young 
uh, children so but i wanted to ask that as far as i know there is a stronger children have a good immune system a good defense system as they have the thymus gland and they have good respond they respond very strongly towards uh, infections so so why can't we give live attenuated ultimately it's the weakened microorganisms that's right uh, i i think you know this is certainly it, it should be possible but you know all the dosages and all these other things have to be uh, very carefully worked out uh, you know oh. in in the case of uh, in the case of very young children and so that the, the, uh, that and it's not so easy to get permission to carry out you know vaccine trials in very okay. young children so so okay. there's a lot you know where of titration and things that has to be done okay sir so with the approaches we have lots of challenges that come into our way so so uh, the i think the most challenging thing these days in developing a vaccine is the pace of the mutation of the virus as we know that it is mutating at a very high speed and at approximately at every 7 days it is mutating so what do you think in what ways to what extent it is challenging the development of vaccines so so far the uh, you know the spike protein is the major target of of most vaccine developers and if we look at the mutations in the spike protein there's really only one mutation at a single mm-hmm. position which has uh, really shown significant diversity okay? and there are two variants basically uh, at at one position in the spike protein and that is very unlikely to impact the efficacy of, of a vaccine okay? mm-hmm. so the the, the uh, spike protein is not uh, just a second yeah, sure sir mm-hmm. the spike protein is just not uh, the coronavirus is in general don't mutate that fast and so at the moment the uh, mutations uh, are not i would say a very serious concern you know over a few year time period maybe that situation will change but okay. i don't think it's an immediate concern so we have seen that with different vaccines we have different uh, issues like can we have uh, major health issues once if we have a vaccine for corona virus can we have major health issues like some people develop allergies against some kind of vaccine or there are some side effects like fever and other things so do you think there can be major health issues with uh, the vaccine that, that, that is the reason for conducting all the safety studies both in animals as well as yeah. the phase 1 phase 2 and phase 3 trials you hope to be able to catch such issues during the course of the trial now fundamentally in 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 most of the vaccines that are being tested we essentially have the viral proteins either whether they being made through nucleic acid or directly injected into the body and those same viral proteins is what the body is seeing during natural infection so they isn't a very good reason to believe that there would be and the amount of the vaccine that we give is just a few micrograms that right? you would have seen the dosage is there 20 to 50 100 micrograms and so it's you know it's uh, there's no good reason to believe that these would have long lasting side effects uh, of course there's always these possibilities and that's why the clinical the uh, preclinical and clinical safety testing has to be done so thoroughly okay, to avoid these uh, 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 these possibilities but but the risk of them in my opinion is relatively small okay okay sir so uh so as you have said in your presentation that there are various phases of vaccine trial and it takes time so but uh today uh, there's so much of pre- pressure from the government media people to develop vaccine as soon as possible so as a researcher sir what do you think how you deal with that such pressure well uh you know i we are not really vaccine manufacturers so in that sense the pressure on us is is a little bit less um okay but i think all the manufacturers are also acutely conscious of of uh, you know 
that safety has to be paramount and after all everybody's you know worst nightmare would be that you have a, a vaccine which you put into people and you find it's not safe right so i think yeah. everyone is acutely aware of this possibility and it's you know it's been tested uh, and, uh, you know that's why there are these regulatory pathways and phase 1 2 and 3 trials and uh, you know, uh, so i i don't think that uh, they need i think what is important is that all the data that is generated both in the preclinical uh, uh, tri- studies as well as in the clinical yeah. studies yeah. must be in the public domain okay so that everybody can scrutinize them and that uh, is not always happening and i hope it will happen so so along with these one of the major area of concern is the distribution and it and the measures to carry out the distribution properly so sir in country like as india we have such huge population so how you think the distribution and me- measures will be adopted so that it uh, ensures that vaccine reaches safely to each and every individual of the country so india has had a lot of experience with reaching vaccines you know you can take the case of the uh, polio eradication in india it yeah. is a massive effort and that has been achieved uh, and so and there are number large number of vaccines which are given during routine childhood immunization programs mm-hmm. so you know i as long as the the modality that the vaccine product is is one which uh, you know is compatible with the conditions that we have here i do not see the distribution and also it has to be something that's producible on a scale uh, so that yes uh, it's it's available to all our citizens once those two things are taken care of i, I don't see that it, uh, it's beyond the capability of of, of our country to ensure this Yes. So, more important is to yeah. have a good vaccine product, and then you know. Yes, definitely, sir. So also, uh, I'm observing these days that people think that once the vaccine is there, there will be a flick of a situation solution. There will be one solution, and it will solve all the problems at once. People have such thought process. So, what do you think? Are these expectations realistic? but if you have a good vaccine which protects against infection uh mm-hmm. you know then it will take care of, of 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 the disease i think that uh but uh, but the protection also has to be durable and we don't know we don't know how yeah. how long the protection will be so but if there is a good vaccine with durable protection then it will largely take care of, of the situation but the so Well, I feel that it will take few years, one year, one and a half years, to get back to a complete normal situation. It cannot be like once, yes, within three months, four months, it will be completely fine. That is obviously correct, right? Because the timelines for vaccine testing are are many, many months. So, yeah. uh, and and then once they're tested. I think. Uh, I think there is a problem again. Uh, we'll try to sort it as soon as possible. Kindly be there. We'll entertain the questions that you have asked in the comment section for sure. okay uh, we have a feedback form till then sir comes uh, i would like to give you an information that we have a feedback form uh, which will surely uh, you'll uh, receive that form we request you to kindly uh, fill that feedback so that we can know what improvements we need to bring in our webinar series so that it's more efficient and we are more uh, we can make the talk more informative 
it will be very highly helpful and very supportive if you guys help us to understand where we are lacking so i would request you guys to kindly uh, fill that feedback form okay yes we are back with this yeah sorry i it's okay sir. it's completely fine sir yeah so sir uh, now we'll take some questions from uh, the audiences they have sure. that they have posted on the live chat i would request you to kindly address those questions uh, so there is this question would it be right to say that increasing the sample number can fast track the clinical trials sorry could you repeat that yeah sure sir so the question is would it be right to say that increasing the sample number can fast track the clinical trials i don't understand could you explain uh, what yes sir so we have these clinical trials i uh, can you hear me sir i can hear you i don't understand the question increasing okay. what sample number uh so the question is increasing sample number means uh, all those samples that we are taking from uh, the uh, infect uh, infections from the individuals or uh, through uh, animal models can increase the uh, clinical trial pace as in if in clinical trial we are taking for example 10 samples instead of that we can take 100 and 200 samples for example i'm saying 100 and 200 samples can it okay. increase the pace of clinical well i i think okay there are different you know number the first point is that when we initiate the phase 1 clinical trial we cannot straight away give the vaccine to 100 people because we don't have direct evidence for safety in humans so the way the phase 1 is done you first give it to you know one or two people then you wait for a few days then you give it to a few more and so this and so that process cannot be hurried right because you do not want to simultaneously administer the product to large numbers of people in a phase 1 trial because you don't have an idea about the safety very often you don't have an idea about the dose so you can see in the moderna trial they tried three different doses and one of the doses the high dose was not at all well tolerated by people and that had to be done in a small number of people because yeah. otherwise you would be directly making very a large number of people sick so i think in certainly in a phase 1 you have to start out slow and uh, you know there are well established modalities for the number of people that you can uh, 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 test you know immunize at various stages now one of the concerns that people are having is that by the time we start to do a clinical trial there already may be a large number of people who have encountered the virus and so they would not be the right subjects to test the vaccine because they already have a lot of pre existing immunity so uh, you know finding uh, enough people who have not seen the virus at the time the clinical trial begins uh, but at the same time especially in a phase 3 trial you want a lot of people who have not seen the virus but are living in an area of high prevalence so that you can test their efficacy so these two conditions are not always easy to meet okay so the next question is uh, how long can we depend on antibodies from covid infected patients as a mode of treatment what is the adjuvant of the subunit vaccine you are working on okay so so we are working with uh, we are working with various adjuvants and we have not finalized the uh, adjuvants that uh, the final that will be there in the final uh, formulation we are doing a comparative study of a few different adjuvants so the most commonly used adjuvants which are available in the public domain are alum and derivatives of alum hmm. there are other uh, adjuvants which are uh, not widely available you know they are restricted uh, by the vax by some of the manufacturers and so getting access to uh, what might be the best adjuvant is not always easy so so we you know, we have explored various adjuvants and we are in discussion uh, with uh, uh, with some of the uh, the suppliers uh, or the manufacturers to get access to the other adjuvants okay sir okay so uh, there was a few question uh, can we implement alternative splicing of the spike protein before its expression as an approach of vaccine development sorry asha could you repeat the question yeah sure sir 
can we implement alternative splicing of the spike protein before its expression as an approach of vaccine development? I'm not sure. So we know the three-dimensional structure of the spike protein. We know, uh, we increasingly know which are all the regions where the neutralizing antibodies bind to. So those are the regions that we need to include in our, uh, uh, in our vaccine product because we want through vaccination to generate those kinds of antibodies. So hmm. by splicing, if you mean cutting up fragments of the spike protein so that uh, they display, uh, so that they elicit neutralizing antibodies, yes, certainly one could do that. And that's something we, we and others are also doing. Okay, okay, sir. So uh, there was this question related to uh, reinfection of an individual that uh, can uh, the person get reinfected with some other strain of the virus? So right now, as I say, the, the sequence diversity in the, uh, in the COVID-19, uh, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus is relatively small. So I don't expect that, you know, I, I think that as long as you have uh, 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 sufficient immune memory and uh, that you would be protected against, you know, a large number of, uh, the strain differences are very small. And so, uh, so, so I, I think a person who has recently recovered from infection is unlikely to get reinfected in a short time frame, regardless okay. of whether it's the same strain or a different strain. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, the question, another question is, uh, how could we monitor the efficacy of a developed vaccine in view of the continuously mutating nature of the virus? Right, so that I've already uh, perhaps yeah. answered in that the, the spike is not mutating and the virus in general is not mutating that fast. So oh. uh, uh, so at the present moment, that's not a major concern. Certainly over the course of time, maybe a year or two down the line, one could revisit that and see if there are significant uh, mutations. So you see, because the, 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 the coronavirus, it's produced by a single large piece of uh, of RNA. And so a mutation, uh, you know, unlike the flu virus, which is a segmented virus, uh, they are, you know, more, and also because of the natural error rate of the replication machinery, the mutation rate in coronaviruses is typically thought to be considerably less than flu and especially much less than HIV, which has a very, very high mutation rate. Okay. So uh, there's this last question. Uh, how do we determine the shelf life of a vaccine and how do we decide whether to administer a single dose or a multiple dose? Okay, so the shelf life that the, all the companies, uh, you know, before they go to the to market, mm -hmm. they have to do stability tests on the vaccine and to see under different storage conditions how long the, uh, the vaccine remains uh, uh, efficacious. So that they will recommend a shelf life give, with the given storage condition also. Of course, the shelf life will depend upon the storage condition. And whether to administer a single or multiple doses, that is also something that is decided in the course of clinical testing of the vaccine. So uh, most of the, the vaccines that have been in clinical testing so far, which I think with the exception of the adenoviral vaccines, they have required uh, at least two doses to, uh, mm. to see sufficiently large levels of, of antibodies. Um, mm. And now the duration of protection, we still don't know. So it may be two doses for you know the, the first vaccination event, but then how often people have to get a, a, an additional booster shot that you know, nobody knows the answer to that at this point in time. Okay, okay, sir. So at the end, uh, I would like to request you that if you would like to share any of your uh, message with our viewers. No, I don't. There's nothing, oh. nothing really that I have to say other than you know what I've already said. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so by sure. this, we come to an end of this session. We are highly grateful to you, sir, for giving us your precious time. Thank you so much for that. You have surely helped us and the audience to understand a lot of concepts and facts of COVID-19 vaccine. 
We are obliged to all the prominent scientists who took out time for us. We are thankful to all the listeners who were so patient and showed their interest and enthusiasm. It won't have been possible without everyone's cooperation. We'll be back soon with our next webinar. Till then, stay tuned to our website, YouTube channel, and social media handles for further updates. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, thank you.